I'm David S. Dawson from The Intellectual Podcast, a show that spotlights creatives from all walks of life, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other incredibly geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. This is the official GunnaGeek.com show. Each week, we run down the latest news and happenings in the world of geek. These are your hosts for the show, Stephen, Chris, and SP. Welcome to an all-new episode of the official GunnaGeek.com show. I am Stephen John Drew, and with me, of course, is Chris Farrell. Hi. And also, there's the one and only Stargate Pioneer. Call me SP. Oh, hey, SP. That's nice that you bring that out. That makes it a lot easier. I wish you had said that sooner. I say it every week. If you didn't know this, we talk about geeky things and geeky news each week. But I just want to start off here and first acknowledge the fact that we've had a lively little Discord server the last week or so, including we had a little bit of a message from a certain individual who was happy to hear about a shout out that was given last week. Did you see that today there, Sergey Pioneer? I did. LTT and MKBHD. Yes. What, pray tell, do those acronyms mean? Well, I, I, LTT, I figured out, was Linus Tech Tips. This was from Damien the DM, by the way. And MKBHD, I assume, was almost like NKOTB, but I could be wrong on that. So, Chris, can you <laughs> clarify? It's another tech YouTuber. Oh, so it's not New Kids on the Block. Oh. No, it's not. Okay. All right, well, let's go ahead and roll on to the news. This one here, this is big news. Big news that Chris Farrell is going to tell us about today. I knew one of us would be covering this when I read it this past week, and I was completely surprised that this actually happened um, on the scale that it did. I will admit that I anticipated another title or two, but not on this scale. Go ahead, Chris. So I was surprised too. Now we have to caveat all of this. This is all HBO Max news I'm going to talk about. And there's a couple, there's three different pieces to it right now, and some just came up. Here's the problem. If you are not listening or watching the show in the United States of America, I don't think you can get HBO Max. So I apologize in advance because I'm going to tell you some stuff that's kind of cool that I don't know what they're going to do on the international stage to help support this initiative they're doing. So first of all, we talked about on the show probably a couple weeks ago that Wonder Woman 1984 is going to be coming to HBO Max on launch day in theaters and on the streaming service. And I had complained at that time, well, it's great, but AV snobs like me, we only have a 1080p 5.1 surround sound stream. Well, not anymore, it would appear, because HBO Max did announce that they will be adding 4K, Dolby Atmos, HDR, and Dolby Vision to the service. The first movie that will support that, Wonder Woman 1984, when it launches on December 25th. So that will be on par with the kind of stream that you get from Disney Plus and Netflix and Vudu and Apple Movies and things like that, where it's all 4K HDR Atmos compatible, which I thought was kind of cool. And I was happy to see it because it was one of my complaints about HBO Max at launch is that everything was 1080p. And I'm sure there's content that was done that is done in 4K. So I wanted it. Yeah, uh, I know that you've been wanting that for a while. I still don't own a 4K TV, but one day, one day I will. And because I'm Canadian, this won't affect me at all. Yeah, I, I don't know what Canada's distribution plans are for what they did announce this last week. So I don't know if you saw that or not, but Warner Brothers did announce they will be premiering their full slate of 2021 films on HBO Max simultaneously with theatrical releases. So does yeah. that mean that they're actually going to run all of these movies at one time in the movie theater because it's simultaneously? Is that what you mean by that? It, it does not. It means oh. when the movie would come and hit the theater, it will also be available on HBO Max. Now It's going to hit the theater like a superhero would and destroy it? Or like a, a satellite super coming out of the sky into Steven's house. Oh, that's even better. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I yeah. thought you guys would like that. But what the plan here is, is when a movie would launch in theater, it will also be available on HBO Max. However, I believe it was Deadline.com where I had read that it will only be available on HBO Max 
for 30 days. After those 30 days are up, it will only be in theaters until a date that is to be defined later when it would come out for regular release on HBO Max or home movie theaters. And Suncast is asking, do they have any titles that are worth watching? Keep that in mind when we get to the end of this news story, because I was going to share with you what a few of these titles are that are coming direct to HBO Max. Wait a minute, Chris. So 4K is good, but what about like refresh rate and HDR and all that? Well, they will be HDR Dolby Vision compatible. I don't know what the refresh rate is going to be on it. I assume 60 hertz, 60 frames per second kind of thing, bare minimum. I mean, most movies are presented around that, even the ones that we get on 4K discs. I mean, what are they presented which, in the theater? I don't know. I'm not a theater it's aficionado. It's got to be like, like 120 or four, uh, 240. I, I mean, generally nowadays, what you get on the disc is equivalent to what they played in the theater because they just push play on a digital movie anymore. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, it's true. They're not splicing film reels together like they used to in the past and things like that. They have a server and they push play on a lot of things, unless it is something that is a special old feature that comes in on tape. So I wasn't trying to be glib. That's just, it's how things work nowadays. Uh, One thing I do want to mention, though, Warner Brothers did say this is a plan for 2021 only, not to be read as indicative of any future plans for what they intend to do in 2022. This is effectively what they're saying, something they're doing because of the pandemic and the fact that they've got a slate of all these movies that they can't just keep queuing up and not releasing. So they're going to put them out on HBO Max and effectively try and drive people into subscribing to their streaming service that may not have already. Solid plan. And I'm curious, and we don't have to deep dive on this, what Disney's plan will be in the future now, because we talked about on this show that their plan to put Mulan on the service for 30 bucks on top of your subscription fee was interesting, but yeah, why? I don't get it. So now you've got Warner Brothers saying, hey, we've got 17 new releases next year that are all coming to our streaming service. Uh, What you going to do, Disney? Not fair, not fair, because Disney came and they went, we're going to make Disney Plus. And then they launched Disney Plus and everybody came in and signed up for Disney Plus without a bunch of these. HBO Max is launched and a bunch of people are like, why do I want to get HBO Max? So this is I mean, a, um, this is there's marketing incentive for all of this okay, here. So, so Disney that, doesn't that's have fair, that. That's a fair statement. But at the same time, one of their direct competitors in the motion picture arena has basically just changed the game on them. I think it's fair to say, Disney, what do you plan to do with your slate of new releases? Because they have done kind of a hybrid approach to this. They did Mulan that was you pay your 30 bucks on top of the fee. They did some other movies that was, hey, instead of coming out in the theaters like Hamilton, we're just going to put direct to Disney+. Plus. So let's see if they follow some the similar approach for some of their 2021 slated movies. Do I think it's going to happen for Black Widow? No, but I think you could make an argument they might want to consider or could consider it since Warner Brothers is doing it with Wonder Woman. I think, I think, and I'll let you get to listing all the movies in a second here, but I think we might see this actually. The, this whole thing will push, um, I think, Black Widow to coming to the streaming service in some form. I still don't think they're going to do free. I think Disney has the upper hand here and I think they can get away with it. And I think that there's more demand for the Marvel movies than there is for the Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman was a great film. I don't know that you have that same hype. And again, there's marketing incentive. I don't think we'll get the free, but I think this will push push Disney to finally release it. I think Disney's going to wait because they want it to be on the big screen. Yeah, they're playing a wait game, seeing when the vaccine is out, when people start to go back to their lives as normal. And they want those big box offices in the theater. They don't want people watching it at home. They want this return to normalcy, we're whatever al- that is. We're almost at a year without movie theaters and the future of their franchise, their most successful franchise that they've got going on right now is on hold because of this. There's filming yeah. going on everywhere else and they You're can't correct. continue because of this one film. I think they're going to drop it. Yeah, but you got to remember how much of a PR hit are they going to take if their first Black Widow movie, the one that they should have done many years ago, according to a bunch of folks before Wonder Woman, before Wonder Wonder Woman, they don't put out in theaters. You've got to remember, that's part of what's going to come into play here. I don't think so. I think you're wrong. I think March, March, (laughs) March to May. That was a concern because people kept thinking, oh, we're just a few months away, a few months away. Now we're looking at most of the world not being 
fully o- like quote over this until late 2021. People now realize that things are they are right now and and are and have been over the last few months are going to be a norm. People will excuse it because of the COVID factor. At the beginning of the pandemic, people didn't know. Now that we're getting the vaccine, now they're getting back into that territory where that might be. But I think they've got a few much a few months more window but where people will no will not judge it because of the COVID well, factor. I look forward to forwarding you every article I find on the internet about how they did Black Widow dirty by not putting her movie out in theaters and things like that if they do this because you know there's going to be a crap load of bad press about but, it. But again, Wonder Woman is going out in theaters technically. Yeah, let's be honest though. How many people are actually going to go to the theaters to see that? And it is also happening in other countries it's going to theaters, but even then like there's some folks I follow that live in the UK on Twitter who are going, I want to see this movie, but I don't want to see this movie enough to go to the theater. What is our UK equivalent to HBO Max to catch Wonder Woman 84? You also have countries like New Zealand, which have done a pretty good job at containing the virus. So their movie theaters, which I don't know for a fact, but their movie theaters are probably open. So they same can with, go to theaters. Same with Australia, I wager too. But that's yeah. neither here nor there. There are a couple other points on this real quick. This was breaking news as of tonight. I mentioned there's 17 movies that are going to be going direct to HBO Max. Well, according to Variety, Legendary Pictures is considering now suing Warner Brothers over their plans to debut Godzilla vs. Kong and Dune directly on HBO Max. According to the article over on CBR, both of these big budget projects were primarily financed by Legendary, yet the production company was kept in the dark on Warner Brothers' plans to release the films onto HBO Max. Providing additional frustration is that WB prevented Legendary from selling Godzilla vs. Kong to Netflix months prior. So we are potentially going to have some lawsuits coming into play because there are movies that were financed by uh, Warner Brothers that uh, that they have the distribution rights to. The, the people who did all the work are kind of going, wait, what? <laughs> so we'll see what happens there. And so as far as the slate goes... The, the movie slate that's out, what what do you think is the biggest highlight from it? Or do you want to run through the whole thing? I have a very short list. I won't go through all the stars and stuff like that, but I pulled probably like five or six out. First is going to be one of the family ones kids are probably going to care about. We as adults probably won't care as much, but you guys, especially Steven with younger children, Tom and Jerry drops March 5th, 2021. It is a live action slash animated combination that's supposedly the origin story of why they hate, why a dog and a, excuse me, a cat and a mouse hate each other. My kids don't does know the, who Tom and Jerry are. Yeah, Fair. does the cat actually die this time around? Because the cat was subjected to scratchy. an <laughs> incredible amount of violence. That's itchy and scratchy. Uh, next up, May May 21st, 2021 is Godzilla vs. Kong, which is kind of a sp- sequel to Godzilla King of Monsters and Kong Skull Island, which I didn't realize. And there are a bunch of people who are big fans of kaiju monsters and things like that that are super excited for it. So the fact it's coming direct to streaming and they won't have to brave a theater. They're excited by that. Is but this that part of the cool. same universe? All yes. the films are in the same universe? Well, these three at least are in the same universe in current day. I don't know if that ties into any of the olden day Godzilla or Kong movies. Okay. Uh, July 16th, 2021, Space Jam, A New Legacy. This is a sequel to the 1996 Space Jam starring Michael Jordan. This one stars LeBron James. There are a bunch of millennials or people who are roughly my age that will be very excited because we grew up watching Space Jam all the time. I thought Space well, Jam was great. I think this sounds horrific. I, That'll be fun. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm a miracle guy. I'm a hockey guy. I am not a basketball guy, so I have no interest in this, but I know a lot of people are. It's cashing in on nostalgia with people about my age, give or take five years on either end. Is what I would say, because those are the folks that remember watching this movie as a kid, getting into the craze, especially the craze around Michael Jordan, who is the goat. It's not LeBron. LeBron is not the goat in uh, the NBA. It's still Jordan. Uh, Other movies, uh, August 6, 2021, James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, which is the soft reboot or standalone sequel to the 2016 Academy Award winning film Suicide Squad. Uh, You know, the only reason I care about this is Margot Robbie. Who cares about the rest, including James Gunn? I care about it because it's James Gunn and the cast looks fantastic. Mm. I'm on board. I'm not. I'm interested I'll, too. I think I'll, I think it's going to be a fun time. I think that they learned their mm-hmm. lesson. I have 
I have hope just based off of who they hired to do it. <sighs> it's Warner Brothers. Look they at the cast of James Gunn. They let him do I, what he wants. Yeah, so look at the cast on previous films. They, they, it's Warner Brothers. They've all tanked, oh, in my opinion. I don't know that the cast when, did we ever get a single announcement from the other movies that it wasn't criticized by the casting? <laughs> like all of them, I all of them were, were criticizing criticized. Jason Momoa as Aquaman just because, oh, Aquaman. Yeah, that's a big joke. Well, no, well, it's, it's not. It was actually pretty joke, cool. Momoa. Yeah. I, no, the movie's terrible, though. But that's Horrible. the point. Horrible yeah, movie. The movie's bad. I, the movie's bad. I enjoyed the movie, but I'm not going to support it. Uh, next up in this list, I got two left. We talked about it real briefly. Uh, Dune, which also has a lawsuit pending on it. It's Dennis Villanueva's adaptation of Dune, which the trailers look beautiful. It's got a really great cast. I wanted to see it, and now I'll be able to watch it at home, assuming the lawsuit doesn't prevent it from being released. And then finally, the December 22nd. I'm sorry, go ahead. The Spice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, then finally, the last one I wanted to bring up, December 22nd, 2021, The Matrix 4, Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss, Jada Pinkett Smith return, Lana Wachowski directs. So only one of the Wachowskis is returning, but it is a fourth entry in the film, brings back those folks, also brings in Neil Patrick Harris and Priyanka Chopra, who were a couple of the other that they mentioned. Return. Neo returns. I just, well, I know we sure talked how about it before, work, I just, I, I don't, I, no. You know what? It's fine. I haven't watched the trilogy in a long time, but I seem to remember the bar is set very low <laughs> right now. <laughs> With the last couple. I, I think the bar is low. No, I mean, it's fine. I'm looking forward to this I, one. I, I mean, no, Matrix I, 3 was not a good movie, but... That's what I mean. I, still I think the bar is low, and I'm hoping that this can come in and, and redeem it. <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully. John who gets to play with guns some more. I'm totally on board with this because as we've seen with the John Wick movies, when Keanu gets to do stunts and play with guns, it's a lot of fun. I didn't mind two and three. I'm, I'm not a huge connoisseur of the matrix, but it was okay. And at the end I was okay because Neo died. That was a big sacrifice. Spoilers. Whoa. For, Whoa. And then they beat you over the head with the Christ symbolism. <laughs> not subtly whatsoever no, no. <laughs> yeah i'm curious how this is all gonna work out here um but hey you know like i said i think the bar was left pretty low and i i look i am looking forward to this as well in any case like i think chris you just went through a whole bunch of big titles that i think we'd all heard of before and and knew they were coming and now they're going to be available on hbo max streaming like how for a month or whatever. How crazy is that? Mm -hmm. I did hear, by the way, that apparently the um, the free 30-day trial or 14-day trial will be gone by the time this gone. all kicks it's off. It's already gone. Is it? It doesn't yeah, exist they, anymore. Gone. Yeah. When they made the announcement, they took that away. Okay. <laughs> this got announced. They're like, bye-bye now. <laughs> so I want to bring you guys back. And I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but the early days of HBO, right? The early 80s when HBO first came out, it was home box office, right? And think about showing the big name films through the 80s that you are aware of back to the future for instance think of showing back to the future in this sort of arrangement back then given the home theater equipment that was available at the time mm -hmm. it just it wouldn't have happened i think what really makes this happen one is the pandemic but two because of the great big home theater equipment that is available to us at relatively low cost that a lot of people already have in their homes. So I think this is a great leveraging of the availability of theaters, of the fact that people have their own equipment and that people just don't want to congregate with each other. So I'll be interested to see how successful this is between the first few movies and not Tom and Jerry, but like Space Jam and Suicide Squad versus and maybe wonder woman versus like dune and matrix four later in the year because, well, there's a bunch of other stuff that i didn't list i put it in the chat for folks right but i think that in later in the year when more theaters open up worldwide because i'm just going to speculate that that's going to happen that maybe uh, the more people will go to theaters because they they want to be social and they want to go to the theaters and that sort of thing but that's I just will, what I'm thinking. I will say, I think you are overestimating a bit 
the prevalence of high quality AV equipment factoring into their decision because there's also a generation younger than us that's going to watch all this stuff on their cell phone because that's how they consume all their media or yeah, on maybe, their tablet maybe. and things like that. I, I, it makes it a nicer experience for those of us that have that equipment, but they put it out there in a way that anyone can consume regardless well, of the device. Even even then, so the, the small mobile equipment didn't exist back in the early True. 80s with home box office. There's no way they could have pulled this th- whole thing off in the early 80s unless there was a serious pandemic and nobody was going to go outside for three years. And we also talk about a lot smaller number of movies and things like that that would have been released back in those days. Hollywood business has blown up a lot. Now you get to the fact where there's like, when we go back to the normal movie structure, multiple new releases each week. And we don't didn't really have that when I was a kid growing up, at least it was, hey, here's the cool new movies coming out this month. There was like two. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to go back and look at like IMDb. So you can go back and see how many movies were released on different websites per year. And in the 70s and early 80s, it was like 50. Mm-hmm. But now it's like a thousand. And it's yeah. just the difference. The, the business has changed so much. and It's kind of just astonishing to see. And uh, there are some people right. who are saying, oh, this is a nail in the coffin of movie theaters. I don't think it is because the studios are relying on the movie theaters for a lot of stuff still. They're not going to make near as much money off of these 17 movies they put out on HBO Max compared to if they came out in theaters. Right. Can so I, am I allowed to come back? You told, no. you told me to think back to the early 80s, and I wasn't around in the early 80s, oh, so I left. Is that the gimmick you were doing? So I left. I was very confused. Because I wasn't I around. I thought you left because your boys were being boisterous, and you were going to take care of parental issues. No, I just, I you told me to think back to the early 80s, so I tried. I, I did what I could, and I tried to disappear. So. Well, I also said if you were there then, if not, I would. I gave you a visual. I showed you what was that de- little 19 inch TV back in the air, barely black and white, you know, barely color back then. <laughs> Definitely like 360 on the uh, resolution. I wouldn't have wanted to watch any movie back then at home. No. I mean, it was great for home box office because then you could see like movies and catch up on them and, and rewatch stuff. But first run, you wanted to see that stuff in the theater. Well, I look forward to this this and seeing how it might or might not come up to Canada. <laughs> SB, why don't you take us to our next news point here? Yeah, talking about the day that the movie theaters fell, we're going to talk about the day that the observatory fell. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, I ran a story about the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, the fact that they were closing it down because a cable snapped and they didn't think it was safe. And they were going to look at options for tearing it down. They talked about explosives. They talked about helicopters. Well, wouldn't you know it? A little drone brought it down. Not entirely true, but kind of. So let's talk about what happened here. Shortly after we recorded our last episode last week, actually the next morning, the Arecibo Observatory had a catastrophic failure and it was announced on a tweet at 9 a.m. from the uh, National Science Foundation's uh, Twitter account stating that on December 1st, 2020, it confirmed that the event happened and the uh, Arecibo Observatory collapsed an hour earlier. Now, in a post on the National Science Foundation's website posted on uh, dated December 1st, 2020, they said, quote, and I'm going to read this, quote, The instrument platform of the 305-meter telescope at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico fell at approximately 7.55 a.m. Atlantic Standard Time, December 1st, resulting in damage to the dish and surrounding facilities. No injuries were reported as a result of the collapse. The U.S. National Science Foundation ordered the area around the telescope to be cleared of unauthorized personnel since the failure of a cable November 6th. Local authorities will keep the area cordoned off as engineers work to assess the stability of the observatory's other structures. Top priorities are maintaining safety at the site, conducting a complete damage assessment as quickly as possible, and taking action to contain and mitigate any environmental damage caused by the structure or its materials. While the telescope was a key part of the facility, The observatory has other scientific and educational infrastructure that NSF will work with stakeholders to bring back home, to bring back online, unquote. Now, there are two videos that documented the 17 second collapse. There was one video that was taken from a drone. That's why I said the drone brought it down. And it was near the sensor platform and it was viewing one of the cables of the support. 
Now that cable broke. You can clearly see the cable snapping. It is unclear when the drone was sent up, but in several reports that I read, other cables snapped shortly before the final cable snapped, which is documented in the video. So I don't know if the drone was set up after those initial snaps or if the drone was in the air documenting the whole thing. It's kind of nebulous as to what happened when. Now, there was another video that was taken from the Arecibo control room that shows the sensor platform gently swinging to the ground towards the control room as massive debris flew around and the support towers collapsed. In that video, I didn't see the drone, but I know the drone was up there. So basically the drone was so small that you couldn't tell where it was up there and if it was just sent up to see the, the collapse or not. But those are two awesome videos. If you haven't seen them, they I are. have posted some links on our Discord server at guineageek.com slash Discord. And it was quite the spectacle. Such a large unplanned collapse it happened in daytime. They were able to catch it on two video streams. Unfortunately, at this point, there has been no plan set to rebuild the giant radio telescope, but they are searching for possibilities at this time with the National Science Foundation. And it's not the same as what we saw in Goldeneye. No. No, but there was no explosion. It was just <laughs> a collapse. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, guys, you know, being an engineer myself, and being kind of a connoisseur of failures and infrastructure collapses and stuff like that. These cables were 60 years old and they were in a hot, humid location. If these cables weren't necessarily um, contained correctly, if they didn't have the correct anti-rusting proof on them, if they, if they weren't maintained correctly, I could totally see this as happening. So this, this had a good 60 year lifespan where it was in the world. But those cables needed to be either better maintained or this is all they got. So if they want to do this again, that's the sort of thing you got to look forward to is, do you want to construct it differently? Do you want to do different things to the cables or do you just want to plan 50 years? That's all we got. Then we got to tear it down and start new. I don't know. Well, there was definitely some neat videos. Um... I can appreciate what you're saying about, you know, seeing them and things like that, but it's still sad nonetheless. It's very sad, especially mm -hmm. the dish itself was damaged, not only with the sensor platform coming down, but the cables kind of ripping into it. And then the actual three support struts that came down on top of the dish, just, just the level. If you see some of the pictures and on the story on the National Science Foundation site, they have all the pictures, all the videos. You can definitely see everything there. And it's it's really sad, especially for the scientists that have used it. They're like, oh, we can't search for E.T. anymore. Well, I think Liberty Dude in our chat, which, by the way, if you didn't know this, we record this live on Mondays at 8.45 p.m. Eastern at Geeks.Live. Uh, Liberty Dude says the aliens responded and the antenna couldn't handle the signal. I could see that. You know, the Deep Space Network was just upgraded to handle better signals so maybe it they just hit the wrong antenna if they would have hit one of the deep space network antennas they would have been fine but they hit the arecibo network dish instead i would just like to apologize because i understand that they were targeting my house and they just got the coordinates wrong again yeah damn it well moving on to the next news point here it's all about apple music if you forgot about it apple music is still a thing yes apple music is still trying to be a big player in the world of music streaming they're, isn't it pretty high up there now? they're they're getting higher and higher um but i think they i think spotify still dominates them don't they Spotify, I do believe, is number one, but I thought Apple Music was up there now. Well, they're they're pretty high. But anyways, I look like <laughs> to take shots against Apple Music. But uh, Apple Music is now available in more locations because Google announced today that Apple Music is available on Google Assistant-enabled smart speakers and displays. This means that you can now get Apple Music on Nest Audio, Nest Hub Max, Nest Mini, or any other speaker or display that has the Google Assistant. So you can hear Apple Music through those as well as places it already was, such as the Amazon Voice Services, which has been for a little while now. I wanted to mention this because I think this, this is another example of one of those silly feuds that are finally going away for consumer benefit. Because you know that that's why it wasn't on there, especially because it was on Amazon for a while. 
you know, Google has been trying to, all kidding aside about the shots getting up against Apple Music, Google has really also been trying to like, you know, come in there and with with their weird fractured music system that they've had between Google Play Music and YouTube Music and all that. Well, there. they did just shut down Google Play Music right. and force everyone to YouTube, it, it, which exactly. is a nightmare. So, so a it's, nightmare. Quite, it's ridiculous on the Google side of things. You know, uh, I was kidding about the Apple, but uh, the Google is seriously a mess. So you know that that's why that wasn't on there. You, you can only read between the lines that there was just some form of piss and match that happened there. And I'm glad to see actually that this is on there because I do know there are people who, lots of people who have Apple Music. And so it's nice to see that it is on the Google Assistant devices because smart speakers are becoming an easy way for people to listen. I think you what you said a minute ago, Chris, uh, or a few minutes ago about there being a generation of people who don't, are are willing to watch movies on phones. I think there's also people, a generation of people who aren't necessarily looking for the highest fidelity sound either. And so these devices work well for those. And if you want to, you know, if you go to the upper tiers, you can get really good quality, but there still are systems that just shame those. But there's people who listen just on a regular Nest audio and have no problems at all and quite enjoy it. So I think that this is great uh, because these speakers, I know like I, I, I a lot of times stream stuff through my Echo Show 8 and there's there's way better audio at my disposal if I was to play it through my computer, but it's just convenient. Yeah, but here's the thing. Like you mentioned, convenience trumps fidelity. I just have to be like, hey, a word, play this versus pulling out my phone, pairing to a good speaker, pulling out my good headphones. I could just lean back in my chair, be doing something. Like, hey, I wanted to hear this song or hey, I wanted to know what's going on in the world. Tune to this radio station or tune to this satellite station and bada bing, bada boom, you're done. Convenience yep. trumps fidelity. It's the same thing we see in a lot of these streaming services anymore is, yes, I have the 4K disc, which is the best optimal way to play it. But I can also just push play on Netflix <laughs> yeah. and it's about 90% the same, but I don't have to go remember where I left the damn disc and then make sure that my Xbox's Blu-ray player is downloaded and installed and wait for it to spin up. I've already been watching the movie for five minutes by the time that's ready to go. Yeah. Can I put my conspiracy corner hat on? Sure. Oh, yes. Do you have a hat? Do you have sure. an actual hat for this? Uh, well, no, not I, here. It's behind the curtain. I'm sorry. Mm, I'll do better next time, guys. Anyway, let's pretend I have the conspiracy hat on. Okay. And what I think is that because of Spotify, you mentioned that at the beginning, Chris, right? Because of Spotify and Apple losing market share, Apple lowered their asking price. So it made it more palpable for Google to go ahead and, and go do this, or or maybe I, Apple raised their price for to, you know to pay Google. I don't know how I, these I'm things work. I'm not sure that they're paying for this though. I mean, this is one of those things they've opened it to multiple other services. They probably just had to hammer something out. Yeah, there, because, there's there's probably some money going back and forth because ultimately you're talking about streaming music, right? And, and you know, yeah, yeah, podcast. But there's a difference know. between your device that streams it and the streaming subscription that you buy outside of that. Okay, all I'm saying is I'm not going to discount the fact that Apple's grip on th what they had a solid, you know, they were the ones to go to for all this for quite some time. It's not the way anymore. So all of a sudden they're like, uh, okay, we're going to give this to you for, for a lower price or whatever. This is not so. the way. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> um... This is not the way what? You're disagreeing with me? No, no. I was making a this is the way joke. That's all. Okay. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how this all works with money that's exchanged or what is or is not exchanged. But it's an, it's an interesting theory nonetheless. And, and one that I, I just want to dabble or hang on for one more second as I give the video viewers a little thing. So there you go. You're in your conspiracy corner. For some reason, it's red. Oh, thanks. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to get some um, music that is not the same as other music that might be out there. We need so something we that it. sounds like the X-Files theme, but is legally distinct. Yeah, <laughs> and legally distinct from something else out mm -hmm. there. No Sorry, idea. Andrew. No we'll idea. just add an extra beat. That's what Vanilla Ice said you as, could do, and you can steal the one. As the, the owner of this show, I have no idea what you're talking about, SB, and I'm going to deny it till the end. Okay. <laughs> 
whatever whatever works for you guys conspirators all, right. all around me and lastly before we get to sb space symposium this week a uh, little quick extra extra hit here that we're gonna turn over to chris farrell that's right blind toss big papa is back to throw it to Chris Farrell to run down a couple of features that were just announced today on his beautiful new phone that he's going to test out and report back to us about. This means I have to retain what I shared with you earlier. <laughs> um, good thing I was actually reading through some of this stuff while we were uh, in the beginning of pre-show. So if you are familiar with the Google Pixel phones, they do what is called Pixel feature drops every three to four months where they drop out a bunch of updates to Pixel phone owners that may eventually make it to the rest of Android may not. Some of the stuff that they drop out today is out there as an update. There is a leaked adaptive sound feature that came out that is similar to what they have done putting in the uh, home assistance that basically uses the microphone on your phone to kind of get a lay of the acoustics and the layout of the room based off echo and things like that to finally tweak the speakers on your phone. So if you're streaming content through the speakers there, it sounds better. That's coming out. One of the things that I'm really intrigued about is there's an adaptive charging feature comes that, that came out that allows you basically to set my understanding, and this is only from skimming, so if I'm wrong, please correct me, Stephen, that effectively makes it say, hey, I know that if you have an alarm set for 5 a.m., we'll use this adaptive charging feature to say, we are not going to get your phone to 100% power until, say, 30 minutes before 5 a.m. That way, you're not charging super fast, putting a bunch of strain on your battery because fast charging puts strain on batteries and then trickle charging all night. Instead, you just slow charge all night. It's something similar to what Tesla does with how they charge their batteries. You can set it on a schedule. But that's kind of cool. There's also a new update to the adapt excuse me, Adaptive Connectivity Services app. I had to find the right thing there. So if you are someone who has a phone with 5G that is a Pixel, so the Pixel 5 or the Pixel 4a 5G, they are taking a feature that is probably been, that I believe is already in iPhones, which is they give it the smart capability to know when to toggle back and forth between LTE and 5G. Why do they do this? Because 5G is very battery hungry when you're using it. You can get a bunch of data. But the principle here is if you're sending emails, you're scrolling social media, things like that, that is supposed to be smart enough to keep you on an LTE mobile connection. But say you start streaming a movie or streaming music or something like that, the phone is supposedly going to be smart enough to go, oh, this is something that I need more throughput for. Let's switch over to the 5G connection so we can get faster connection speeds. That could be pretty cool if that works. Um, I literally just did the update to my phone right before the show started. It finished up as the show was going on. I don't see these features in there yet. So my guess is the feature drop is being done outside the December security update. So I'm not sure when it will come to my Pixel phone. But some of these things, pretty cool. That's essentially my understanding of them as well. And i um, just disappointed that they're not coming to the 4A. They're only the 4A 5G well, for now. Some of these things are coming to all of the Pixel phones. Like, you don't need the adaptive connectivity services. You don't have 5G in the Pixel 4A. But what if I wanted 5G? You'd have to buy a new phone because your modem doesn't support it. But I wrote 5G on the back of my phone. Ah, well, then you mag that magically solved all your problems right there. But it became a 4A 5G when I did that. And it made your screen get bigger and everything? Yeah. And put a better processor yeah. in. <laughs> so a lot of these Google Pixel features, they may start out with the newest phones and they will eventually trickle down to some of the older phones. So don't be shocked if like this adaptive battery feature may not be in, say, the Pixel 3s yet. But wait, say six months from now, it may be in one of the Pixel drops there. They tend to start with the newer phones and then trickle these down to the phones that are still being supported i thought because i thought that one was more or less rumored a couple months ago and it, it was supposed to be coming to the the 4a i thought that it that wouldn't was, surprise me yeah so i anywho i look forward to finding your experience Ooh. and you giving me reasons that i should have waited for the 4a 5g well here and we wanted to talk about music streaming because remember youtube music is a great service they are saying now that there is the uh, pixels now playing feature we've talked about where if there's music playing you can look at your phone it'll tell you what the music is you can then export that now playing stuff to a playlist in youtube music so mm -hmm. say you go over to a friend's house and you're like the music's awesome you can export everything that it heard into a playlist ridiculous that that didn't come a lot sooner it's so is stupid. anyone else doing it though i mean let's be honest it's here. so stupid <sighs> that nobody did because you used to be able to go in and check out your history and there was apps to log it and like it's dumb that they didn't connect connect this years ago 
stupid. I don't know, guys. I think this is a, a lot of AI ML, machine learning sort of thing. And it just, it takes processing power on board the phone, believe it or not, to do this sort of thing. And I don't think until very recently that processing power was really there to run that sort of identification and automated playlists. So this is probably the right place in the right time for it to evolve on all architectures. Um, I believe you used to be able to go and view your history. And if you could, well, true. If you could view, okay. view your history, the playlist is not done on your phone. It's done out on the cloud. And so if, if that was possible before, it's not a hard thing to shove that information up to YouTube. It would be interesting to learn if they are doing this on board the phone or if they are offboarding onto the cloud to do this sort of automation. I don't know. They, they are in most cases. Yeah. I mean, they, mm. they do some processing locally, but they tend to offload a lot of the more in-depth stuff so, to the so cloud. The, sa the same process is in place offboarding into the cloud. There has to be enough processing power to do this for every person that's running a Google phone. Google. That's a lot of activity. I guess I'll have to just disagree because Google, that's why Google was always ahead of Siri because they they took that approach from early on with their AI was was to do it all off. So they, well, they've okay. been set up, they've they're, been they're set up for a while. They're still processing that needs to occur in the cloud. And I don't think the processing was available until recently in the cloud to do this for all Google users. This isn't all Google users, it's Pixel users at this point in time. Well, whatever. Which is much smaller install base. And <laughs> yeah, but still, it's a it, lot it's, of processing. It's servers. Google's got servers out the arse, man. It's not the servers, it's the processors. I guess, right. They've got those out the, out the arse, too. <laughs> the, reason, the reason why I, I personally don't know that I, I would agree with that is because of the creepy Google factor. I just actually on Facebook tagged Chris to uh, post... Um, that came up one of those memories things. And it was from, I'm just looking it up here. Where was it? Where was it? Uh, my original post was in 2013, where we first started to look at the Google Now. And uh, my, my post was pulling a Chris Farrell with my creepy Google Now. Yes, Glee was a legit suggestion. So I, I feel creeped out. And this was where first the where Google first started to give me my personalized results. And these were all valid for various different reasons. And so, um, I don't know. Like, And then you look at Google has had the thing where if you have an email, um, like flight, and you have just an itinerary, then it pops up in your Google now. So I don't know. I think Google was way ahead of this. I think that it was, I think it's a good idea. I just think that it could have been done sooner. But that's my thoughts. But we will agree to disagree unless you would like to disagree with that agreement. Ow. <laughs> Let's go ahead My and brain. Move, move on to SP's Space Symposium. All right, SP, what you got this week? Actually, really, really, really excited about this week because as I stated the last time around, I am going to be talking about Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Yes, jam-packed night between the two and what made it so special and what my involvement was in them. It, don't get your hopes up too much, but I did have a small involvement in Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. So what made Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 so special is it had a rare, unusual, and favorable planetary alignment that enabled a singular Grand Tour exploration missions to the outer planets of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. This alignment is so special that it will not occur again for another 176 years. And the United States of America was able to adapt Pioneer 12 and 13 into Voyager 1 and 2 in 1977 and take advantage of this this is science that we are still looking at even today, which is so cool. There is so much that happened. I'm not going to be able to go into it. I could probably go into each individual encounter that these two spacecraft had with a new space symposium, but just take my word for it. Look into these two probes if you don't know them already. This is amazing. This is some of the best science 
that has been done in the terms of the grandi grandioseness of the mission. Maybe not the most science that was ever done in a singular mission, but definitely the most, you know, Star Trek five year voyage sort of stuff. So this was really cool. As I stated before, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were twin spacecraft. They were exactly the same, and they were adapted from the Pioneer series. We just covered Pioneer 11 a couple of uh, times ago, and it was the 12th and 13th Pioneer space buses, and they turned it into Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. It was to continue the United States exploration of the outer solar system space planets, the gas giants, and using the planetary alignment that was unusual and pretty much the singular huge gravity slingshot from Jupiter made this possible. Now, Voyager 1 surveyed both Jupiter and Saturn, and we'll talk about why it ended at Saturn, but that was it. Voyager 2, it had an extended mission because of the success of Voyager 1. We'll talk about that why. And it was able to not only hit Jupiter and Saturn, but also Uranus and Neptune. And to this day, Voyager 2 is the only spacecraft to have visited Uranus and Neptune. And it holds the record to visit more planets than any other man-made object in history. Now, between the two Voyager spacecraft, they explored all of the solar system's gas giant planets, their rings, and 48 of their moons and satellites, including Triton, which is a moon of Neptune, Ganymede, which is a moon of Jupiter, Miranda, which is a moon of Uranus, Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, Dion, which is a moon of Saturn, and more and more and more. So let's get into some of the history here. Voyager 1 actually launched after Voyager 2 a month later, but it was given more speed from its launch, more delta V in rocket terms, and it overtook Voyager 2 after they passed through the asteroid belt in December 1977. We'll get into the exact dates of when they were launched later. Now, in February 1998, Voyager 1 passed Pioneer 10, which we talked about a few times ago, to become the most distant human-made object in outer space. Voyager 1 left the solar system above the solar system ecliptic plane in 2002, and it entered interstellar space in August of 2012. Voyager 2 left the solar system below the solar system ecliptic plane. You can say the navigation occurred in 2002, where it was going off into the lower ecliptic plane. But on December 10th, 2018, the spacecraft joined Voyager 1 as the only human-made objects to enter the space between the stars. Of course, you have Pioneer 10 and 11 that have followed there. There's a total of six spacecraft that are out there right now. Now, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 carry copies of that golden record. We talked about it before in the Pioneer missions, and it's a golden record, an actual LP record, and it's a message from humanity to the cosmos that includes greetings in 55 languages, pictures of people and places on Earth, and music ranging from Beethoven to Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good. Yes, that same nice. Johnny B. Good that we heard in Back to the Future. Chris, you like that, didn't you? I'm excited. I like culturally sharing cultural things to anyone that may happen upon things in the stars. It's too bad, though, that this was two years too early because you said 77, right? Yes. So 79, I believe, is when when uh, Message in a Bottle came out. So that would have been a good one to be on there. I'm sure. All right. So the objective of these missions, of course, was this grand tour of the outer solar system gas giants. I remember this a lot from my personal interactions, but also from watching the original Cosmos with Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan was a big force behind a lot of the space exploration in the 70s. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, a lot of it happened because of Carl Sagan. It, he wasn't the singular force behind it, but he was a big force behind it. And I will always thank Carl Sagan for doing it. He pushed for the United States to have these missions occur in 1977 because when we figured out that you can slingshot around Jupiter and gain some more momentum so you could go see Saturn and Uranus and Neptune that he wanted to go do it. So I just want to say thank you to Carl Sagan for making this happen and the whole team behind Voyager and 1 and Voyager 2. As I mentioned before, they were based on the Pioneer spacecraft bus. 
They had a mass at launch of 825.5 kilograms, which is roughly 1,820 pounds, which is mostly what a Tesla Cybertruck will weigh, you know, probably without batteries, but still, you, you got that weight. So you're throwing a truck out into space, basically. It was mission managed by JPL and developed by JPL. It was launched by a Titan Centaur rocket or a Titan 3E rocket. The launch date for Voyager 2 was August 20th, 1977 from Cape Canaveral. A month later, Voyager 1 launched September 5th, 1977. So they launched backwards, but they launched that way because they knew they were going to have to give more speed to Voyager 1. So Voyager 1 was always going to be in the lead. Again, spacecraft were identical. They had 11 scientific instruments on both. They had an imaging science system, an ultraviolet spectrometer, an infrared inferometer spectrometer. They had a planetary radio astronomy experiment, a photoplanar, photopolar meter, a triaxle flux gate magnometer, which is not a flux capacitor, but it's close. Damn. Matt, you answered yeah. my question. I thought I would. Because I'm sure this went a lot faster than 88 miles per hour. Oh, yeah. These things are cooking. <laughs> they're, they're at like 40,000 miles a second. See? We'd see some serious S then. <laughs> yeah, you would. <laughs> it had a plasma spectrometer on it, a low energy charge particles experiment, a plasma waves experiment, a cosmic ray telescope, and a radio science system. It also, by the way, guys, had an eight track player on board because the eight track tape was recording the images that it took and the observations and it would play it back as it transmitted it back to the deep space network. Some of the firsts here, now this is just some of the science that was done by each of these, not all of it, just some. I had to condense it quite a bit. So Voyager 1 was the first spacecraft to cross the heliosphere, the boundary where the influences uh, between the outside of our solar system are stronger than those from our sun. Voyager 1 is the first human-made object to venture into interstellar space. As I said before, Voyager 1 discovered a thin ring around Jupiter and the two new moons around Jupiter, Thebe and Metis. At Saturn, Voyager 1 found five new moons and a new ring, which they called the G-ring at the time. The discovery of volcanic activity on Io was probably the most exciting discovery of this entire mission. It was just a great surprise. They had no idea it was coming. So both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 uh, saw this. Voyager 1 was the first one to saw it, which was great. Also, Voyager 1 did a Titan flyby at Saturn. Now, because the observations of Titan were considered so vital because it had an atmosphere, the trajectory chosen for Voyager 1 was designed around the optimum Titan flyby so they could get the most data, data from it, which took it below the south pole of Saturn and then out of the plane of the ecliptic ending its planetary science mission. But because that was a success, they did not send Voyager 2 along the same line. And after it flew by Saturn, it was able to go to Neptune and Uranus. So we'll talk about that in a second. Voyager 2 is the only spacecraft to study all four of the solar system's giant planets at close range. Voyager 2 discovered a 14th moon of Jupiter, and this is after Voyager 1 went by. Voyager 2 was the first human-made object to fly past Uranus, and at Uranus, Voyager 2 discovered 10 new moons and a surprising two new rings, which we didn't think were there. Voyager 2 was the first human-made object to fly by Neptune, and to this day, the only one. And at Neptune, Voyager 2 discovered five moons, four rings, and the great dark spot on, Vo on Neptune. Uh, some key dates in September 77, Voyager 1 launched, August 20th, 77, uh, Voyager 2 launched. In March of 1979, Voyager 1 had its Jupiter flyby. In July of 1979, Voyager 2 had its Jupiter flyby. Fast forwarding to Saturn, 1980, in November, Voyager 1 went by Saturn. And August 26th, 1981, so almost a year later, Voyager 2 had its Saturn flyby. In February of 1998, as I said, Voyager 1 left the solar system. In January 1st, 1990, the interstellar mission officially began for Voyager 1. And on August 16th, 2006, 
It reached 100 AUs or astronomical units, which is the distance between Earth and the sun. It reached 100 times that. And on August 1st, 2012, Voyager 1 entered into interstellar space. Now, Voyager 2, after the Saturn flyby, did a Uranus flyby in 1986 and then a Neptune flyby in 1989. And here's where my involvement started. I was at the planetarium at the University of Minnesota watching these images come in. It cool. was amazing. Took all night. We were just sitting there, just awed. This is the first time we had pictures of these planets, guys. That's and I awesome. was, you know, just a young college student going, not realizing the impact of this. To this day, Voyager 2 was the only one to ever go by Uranus and Neptune. These are the only pictures. And I got to see them come in live with a live feed from NASA. So I saw them at the same time that NASA scientists saw. And we had all our scientists in the room just googling over them all and and some people are like wait i want to go back and they're like no i want to see the next one coming <laughs> in so of course we just kept them all they said uh, the guy running the place said we are going to save these images you'll get to see them later but we're just going to go with the live feed right now so it was all great so i did that in both 86 and 89 it was awesome now on december 10th 2018 voyager 2 in entered interstellar space and here is something that I think we talked about last year on July 8th, 2019. Voyager 2 successfully fired its trajectory correction maneuver thrusters. And it has recently in early November, like November 4th, actually contacted us in the deep space network. We actually had to increase the deep space network receiving capability because the signal's so weak, because the power is so weak and it's so far away. But we actually heard from this thing last month. So... Voyager 2 is still out there. It's got a lot of its scientific instruments that are closed down. Voyager 1 is in the same boat. And they're just, get, eventually the RTG, which powers it, is going to run out of power. And they're just going to be dead weights floating through space. Uh, about uh, 50 light years away, both of them, from hitting the next star, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong on that. They're going to hit a what, star? Yeah, they're, they're going to come, like, close but no they're, they're not going to be that close and oh. they won't have any powers and so we won't hear from her or anything like that but that's what's next on their uh, docket there are so many scientific observations from jupiter saturn uranus and neptune that i just don't have time to go through but guys this was amazing this was the grand tour this was the thing in science and still is today because it hit all four of those planets yes we've had other probes go to Jupiter and Saturn, but we haven't had anything go to Uranus and Neptune yet. And uh, it was just amazing. And I don't think in 176 years, if humanity is still on this planet, I don't think we're going to need this gravity assist to get out to the planets. I think we're going to be in expanse mode where, we're, you know, we're going to go out there and be able to have the propulsion to hit these things within a timely manner. So we won't ha ever have to do this again. It, it was just amazing that the teams at NASA, JPL, Carl Sagan was able to do this and it, it read up on this guys, watch some YouTube videos. This is just amazing science. And I will tell you from a personal standpoint, being in the room, not at NASA, but at the university of Minnesota, being in the room with all these scientists watching this data come in was amazing. Something that I will never forget. And probably why I'm big into space telescopes now, because well, it, it was my way of, knowing that I wouldn't be alive in 176 years. So this is the way I can see these things. Let's get a bigger <laughs> telescope out there so we can see Uranus and Neptune. That's cool. Uh, I think this is this is neat, uh, all the accomplishments that, uh, that ha happened. Um, and I just have one question. When do we pick them up? We pick them up when we get the propulsion up to the point where we can go overtake them. I don't know if we ever will because of those golden records. I think they want them... Yeah, mm. One of the things that the teams behind Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 constantly say is these things will actually outlast our solar system. So when our sun you know, goes supernova and becomes a red giant, these things will be outside that sphere. And they'll That's keep cool. going and going and going. And those gold records will persist. So I think nobody wants to bring them back. I so can we put happens. our podcast on a gold record and launch it in space so it outlasts humanity? Yes. And you can pay, I, if you have the money... SpaceX will do it for you. Steven's been saving my wages for years. Let's just use it for this. It sounds like a good idea. I mm -hmm. would just like to highlight that our podcast doesn't sound good by the time it releases, let alone in the dis uh, distant future. Well, How the good thing is another yeah. culture out there, they're going to have to have so many technologically advances to be able to read this old LP from another <laughs> planet. 
that they'll make it sound good. I That's can't true. wait for them to hear my hot takes on the Snyder Cut and the Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, SB, for running that all down. I, I know it's one you've been waiting for a while, and we did bump it a couple of weeks. So thank you very much, SP, for rolling with us while we did that. Do greatly appreciate that. And thank you always for continuing to enlighten us all about the different areas of space history because. Again, I think it's very important that we continue to talk about all of the history that has been made so we can look at the future. I will continue down this road of planetary probes. The next one up is Magellan for Venus. And after that, there is a lot more. There's asteroids and other planets to go through and everything. But then I'm going to get into landers and rovers. And, and that'll be pretty cool when we get that in like two or three years. So th there's just a lot of history to cover here. Cool. Well, that's going to go ahead and wrap us up for this show. Before we go, I want to remind everybody, check out the Gunna Geek Network. Lots of amazing content. When we're not doing this show, you can find Chris Farrell on All Things Good Nerdy. You can find Stargate Pioneer on the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast. And you can find me also on Better Podcasting. I, I assist the, the true star over there, which is named SP. You should check that out at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. So, for episode 357 of the official Gunna Geek Show, I'm Stephen John Drew saying check out our Twitter for all the information on our holiday recording schedule. I'm Chris Farrell, and my Snyder hot takes will live forever. Rest in peace, Arrowverse. See y'all later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for checking out another episode of the official GunnaGeek.com show. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review in Apple Podcasts or a thumbs up on YouTube. You can always join us for our live recording sessions, which stream Mondays at 8.45 p.m. Eastern at www.geeks.live. And remember, you can find our full back catalog at GunnaGeek.com forward slash show. If you're itching for more geeky content, check out other shows on GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Voice work was by Emily Prokop of the Story Behind podcast. That's it for this episode. We hope to see you back again next week.